Buddha in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, there's a whole group of ones, book of ones, talking about mindfulness of the body and praising it. The Buddha says, just as if one, just as all the rivers and streams that flow into the ocean are encompassed within and embodied in the ocean, even so, one who cultivates and develops mindfulness of the body partakes of all states there are that are part of true knowledge. And often mindfulness of the body gets uh, talked about as, say, simple uh, awareness of the actual physical body, which is a really useful conception um, to understand how grounded the body is, how it can serve as an anchor, um, its intuitive feel for right and wrong, for path, and uh, as an anchor away from the more extreme mental states that come into our minds. Ajahn Suchito uh, says that if you become angry, you should power, power up, just power up right down into your feet and um, sort of place your awareness down there where it's solid and grounded and you'll find a refuge there or you can sort of put your mindfulness in your elbow. Your elbows are rarely angry. So there's a lot to be said for this. Similarly, I was talking to someone who was speaking about working with anger and much of both anger and sen sensual lust have to do with a need to uh, release pent up energy. And if you learn to imagine the energy circulating down the front of the body, up the spine, you can get it flowing again, and it doesn't need to release through angry words or some other vent. Similarly, the body is a powerful reference point in terms of intuitively knowing um, a dhammic path through any situation. This sense of uh, when the Buddha compares breaking sila, morality, when you really compromise the way you want to be in the world, um, he compares it to pure sila, the Buddha compares to unbroken, untorn cloth. And I think this metaphor or analogy becomes especially powerful when you think of its inverse, how that moment when you break sila, break morality, how it feels like a the best image I know of is a rusty nail ripping through cloth. And that's an embodied sense, you feel that in your body. Or even that vague sense of disease, almost nausea, when you're doing, when you're wasting your time, when you're not living the life that is worthy of your death, when you are buying into the trivial instead of what has meaning. But the other concept of mindfulness of the body and what uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 10, I believe, um, the Buddha speaks about you know, these four bases of mindfulness. You have mindfulness of the body, which is looking at just the body as a body. You have mindfulness of feelings. You have mindfulness of the mind and mind states and the mindfulness of dhammas, mental categories, dhamma categories. And these are ways of looking at experience, not uh, in terms of self, my body compared to these other bodies. It's not good enough, it's not beautiful, it's just seeing the body as a body, that's that simple. And there's a real power in coming back to that ground of perception. In the Satipatthana Sutta, mindfulness of body, it goes through uh, a variety of different approaches. You can look at mindfulness of breathing, you can be aware of your movements, extending and contracting your limbs, walking. This is sort of that sense of coming into your embodied experience of life. But uh, recent comparative studies between the Chinese texts and the Pali show that originally the Satipatthana Sutta, that first foundation of mindfulness of body, really had to do with looking at the body in terms of its uh, three main approaches. Um, looking at the body in terms of the 32 parts of the body. 
So that's deconstructing the body into its various components. Uh, looking at the body in terms of the charnel ground contemplations, that's an especially fun one. So you just imagine the body decaying into death. And the third one, looking at the body in terms of the four elements of earth, fire, uh, water, and wind. And this way of approaching the body, um, body contemplation, gaya katasati, is not taught in the West very often because it's far more romantic to talk about uh, loving kindness for all beings than it is to ask people to contemplate their spleen. But, but when we look at what analyzing the body in this way does to the mind, it brings about a variety of really powerful benefits. The first is that it allows us to not be controlled by lust. And to have that in your tool belt is no small thing. Um, I think, you know, just to have that ability to cool the mind naturally with a perception of its own for the sake of that coolness is worth a great deal. And then you consider, you know, the added components of, you know, what uh, I think 60% of divorces uh, currently have cite porn addiction as one of their uh, main features or main reasons. And just the sort of rash of um, flood of uh, this sort of stimulus that really it's hard to stand against and to have some tool against that. Um, you know, or when you know, in a committed relationship one becomes attracted to another, to have some tool that one can pull out to cool those fires, that's not a bad thing. The other is uh, another benefit of developing this sort of uh, slight step away from identifying with the body through these sort of contemplations is it prepares one for what happens when the body ages and becomes sick. And the, the Buddha says this, he, uh, it's in a sutta called the Nakula Pitta Sutta to this uh, aging man. And the Buddha says, it is true, it is true Nakula Pitta. Who but if out of mere foolishness could consider this body healthy even for a moment? This body is encumbered, ill, sick, aging. And that can sound, um, you know, a bit, a bit dour, but it is true in the sense that we all are uh, moving towards a place where the body will betray us in one sense or the other. And I remember going to a hospital in Ubon in Northeast Thailand. And as I've said before, the healthcare in Thailand's great. Um, people go there for um, healthcare, uh, you know, surgeries and stuff. Um, the monks get free healthcare, although if you get a really intensive procedure, I think you have to give up a kidney. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but uh, some of the hospitals, the public ones, can be overcrowded. And I remember being in one of these ones in Ubon where the hallways were just filled with beds and the scent of bodily fluids and the moans of people in pain. And just this gigantic sense of people's bodies betraying them in one fell swoop and they weren't prepared. So this is just preparing for that moment when you do get sick and the body, it does what it can, it tries, but eventually it will grow ill. And if you haven't tied your heart to it completely, then when it breaks, your heart doesn't and you're not at this complete loss. You're preparing for your ill aging and you're preparing for death. That's a good thing. And if you think you aren't really identified with a body, um, I think a good, there's a few good experiments you can do, but one is just looking at your reaction when you get bitten by mosquitoes. Um, this is something you have a lot of chance to contemplate in Thailand. But there's this sort of like sense of like, how dare, how dare it? You know, this like, that's my body, you know? And it's just a mosquito bite, like really it's not a lot. And it's, you know, the mosquito's hungry, whatever. But um, just notice that reaction of being invaded and you can begin to parse out how entwined your sense of self is with the body. The next is an, as an act of kindness towards others. Ajahn Panyavado says about 85 or 90% of our impressions of people initially really are uh, about their body. And whether someone is 
ugly or aging by conventional standards or beautiful by conventional standards, I'd say there's probably a pretty equivalent amount of suffering associated with either, either of those. You know, if you're beautiful, to always be wondering if people are nice to you because of who you are or something else. It's a huge gift to be able to approach someone and actually approach them instead of their body. And then the homeless person on the street, the haggard man you know, um, you just see the body as this veil and the spirit begins to shine through. The next is uh, benefit is that when you develop mindfulness of the body, um, the mind becomes luminous. You think of what happens if you take this luminous heart and that heart really believes it's this amalgamation completely, that this is all it is, an amalgamation of bone and blood and pus. How would that darken that? And this doesn't have to, you know, we don't have to move into a discussion about the ontology of spirit or uh, dry materialism or idealism, just that if the mind is clutching at this image of a body as me and mine, it compromises and darkens. So when you begin to release that grip, you notice a natural brightness occur. And the final one is our defilements, greed, hatred, and delusion are profoundly wound up into the body. So when you look through the verses, the ancient texts of the elder monks and nuns, so many of their breakthroughs into uh, enlightenment were predicated on breaking through this first khanda, this first aggregate of the body. Um, and you'll notice it rips apart these defilements in this profound way that sort of high-minded koans, like what was your true face before you were born, can't touch. It's a nitty-gritty practice, but it has immense implications. So this is why it's useful. Um, and how we do it, that's another question. So the first approach, and probably the easiest, is to look at things in terms of the 32 parts of the body. So to see with this sort of power uh, and insight requires the mind to be strong and bright. The body gains strength from movement and exercise. The mind gains strength from stillness and not moving. That's when it grows bright. So what you need to do is you wait until you've had a calm period of meditation. And there will come a point where you just can't focus on your samadhi object anymore. Um, it's like the glass is full. And this can happen within one session, but it can happen very powerfully after a long period of retreat. It's just, it just feels like slamming your head against a wall to keep coming back to the breath. Your mind doesn't want it. And this is where I think... Um, the lack of this teaching has done people a great disservice because what the mind needs to do then is it has this huge store of power. And when it begins to move inexorably from that place, this is when you use it to contemplate the body. And it will be able to see clearly into that body in a way that you've almost never had happen. It'll be a really intense and distinct experience. We call it bhavana maya panya, uh, wisdom from practice as distinct from sutta maya panya, wisdom from study, and chinta maya panya, wisdom from thinking. Bhavana maya panya is particularly associated with meditation. So when the mind begins to move from that bright state, you turn it towards deconstructing the body. And this is uh, the first five objects um, that the Buddha recommended in this list. There's a, a list of 32 objects of the body, which is basically like, Nails, teeth, heads, head, skin, um, bones, pus, tendons, all the fun stuff. But the first five, the external objects that you see, that's what the Buddha gave us. Um, that's the first thing we're given, the first meditation object we're given when we ordain as monastics. It's that important. So those five include nails, teeth, head of the, hair of the head, hair of the body, and skin. And what you do is recite those to yourself and picture them. And you'll find that one of those objects will stand out. It'll grab your attention. It'll be interesting in a way. And that's a good sign. You want to follow that interest. And then you just begin to contemplate. And that word contemplate is 
a difficult one to pin down, but it you have to sort of develop a way of looking at things. So if it's uh, if what catches your attention is hair of the head, um, imagine um, what the hair follicles look up like close up. Imagine what happens when that piece of hair falls into your soup. How suddenly what was a perfectly normal piece of hair that you had no problem with and perfectly normal soup suddenly becomes disgusting, especially if it's someone else's hair. Like, what's going, what's going on there? There's something we're not seeing. So really, like, you can just run through watching the piece of hair fall into the soup. Or you can use words and say, like, why is the soup dirty? You can imagine what happens to your hair after two or three days of not being washed, how it becomes oily, coated, smelly. This body is oozing oil. What happens if you don't wash it? Imagine that. Ask yourself that question. And if you ask yourself this with a calm mind, something will happen where you begin to see clearly the body in a way you never have. If the nails are interesting, you can imagine them growing, uh, imagine them as just so much kind of dead tissue. Um, the skin, uh, everything we see on the body is already dead. Uh, even the skin, if it was the living part of the skin, which is a few millimeters under the surface, it would be so raw, it would be unbelievably painful. The part we see of the body and the skin is dead flesh. Um, even the eyes, which seem alive, only seem that way because they're moist. And the skin, um, if you uh, don't wash it, what happens? Or you can go deeper. Uh, a very powerful object for people is the bones. And the bones are so powerful, often you don't have to picture them. You can just say bones, skull, bones, skull in your head. But you can contemplate, feel the bones in your uh, arm. Imagine them as calcium. Compare them to stones outside. Imagine breaking them apart and watching them fade into so much calcium dust. Is this really you? And you can ask yourself that. Are these bones really you? So I think you're getting the intuition of why we don't talk about this a lot. <laughs> it's, it's kind of strange and a bit off-putting. Yet... It's very powerful. Because if you do that with a calm mind, you'll find the mind doesn't darken or become averse. It becomes bright and cool, and it lets go just a little. And then when push comes to shove and the body becomes sick, you can really look at it with a pretty good-natured smile and be like, well, that's, that's what the body does. It tries its best. And that's a, an important thing to have in your tool belt. Another important thing is to see, um, you know, what type of character you are. So we have three main uh, character types in Buddhism. You have greed, aversion, and delusion. Greed can mature into faith. Uh, aversion can mature into wisdom. Delusion matures into sort of spaciousness. And you can usually tell what type you are, like what, when you walk into a room, What's the first thing you notice? The things you don't like, the things you like, or do you just feel kind of confused? Um, and uh, <laughs> if you're an aversive type, you have to be very careful with body contemplation. It's so powerful that it will kind of shake you to your core a bit. And if you notice yourself being really grumpy the day afterwards, that's probably a sign that you need to not do it anymore and you might be an aversive type. If you're a greed type, it's very safe to do and probably pretty good for you to do. Um, it counteracts greed strongly. And it's important to see that we're not cultivating a negative body image. Negative body image is comparing your own body to other bodies and seeing your, yours as less beautiful. Body contemplation is just seeing all these bodies as these kind of, you know, cute, awkward things that aren't, you know, they're doing their best, but they're just, they're just what they are that much. Asuba is the word for what we're doing. It means not beautiful. And the Buddha, you know, the body is complex and interesting and fascinating, and we can appreciate that. 
but we're swinging the pendulum a little the, to the other way because we're so deluded and attached to it. Sometimes you have to push back a bit. The next uh, way of contemplating the body after the 32 parts is the um, uh, contemplating in terms of the charnel ground contemplations. And if you thought the last one was off-putting, this one's even more so. So in Thailand, it's common. The first time I went to Wat Pananachat, a monastery in Thailand, there was a funeral pyre, and the bodies just burned there. And you just watch it burn. And the monks will gather around, and you watch it decay. And it's just natural. It's just, it's just a body. What's there to be ashamed of? And you think of what we do in the West. Um, and you know, someone I know recently went through this huge thing of trying to get their, um, there's a new service that lets you compost your body. It's really hard to get into. It's barely legal. It's quite expensive. And honestly, all that this person is asking is for, to let their body decay normally. What's legal is for them to dress you up in a suit, put makeup on, pump you full of uh, chemicals so that you look about normal, bury you in a box. And like, how is that not way more messed up? <laughs> you know, like, what's this strange schizophrenia in our culture? Like, we're so deluded about the body, we don't see our delusion. But you can get these little glimpses of, of our delusion in these, in these various ways of how our culture reacts to death. And in Thailand, you know, we go to autopsies um, and watch bodies cut open. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, I know one Buddhist love story. Uh, he's a monk now, but he met his girlfriend. They were in a monastery, and he's like, there's sort of a, a picture book of, of, of dead bodies up uh, in the monastery where you can look when you're really calm to contemplate. And he met his, this girl, and, they're, uh, and he's like, where are you going? And, or she said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to go look at some dead bodies. And she said, how dead are they? And he said, pretty dead. So, and then they fell in love. So there you go. <laughs> Buddhist love story. <laughs> um, the charnel ground contemplations are pretty intense. They can be useful, but I'd lean more towards the 32 parts at first. And the fourth, the third way of contemplating the body the Buddha recommends is element contemplation of looking at the body in terms of earth, solidity, uh, water, liquidity, cohesion, wind, movement, and fire, uh, the degree of warmth or heat. And we hear these four elements and we think it's pretty medieval. I mean, now we have the periodic table. Why do we need this sort of like outdated mode? And it gets kind of neutered in the West by just looking at it as the sensations in the body, which is valid to a point. But these, this division of our perception of the world is actually really helpful. Um, first of all, just to unpack the sort of modern view of material world that we think is so advanced. Like, you know, each of the ways we look at the world in terms of the periodic table, um, each one is very constructed for the sake of a certain task. Like the periodic table, you look at what atoms actually are, and it's sort of a cloud of probability. And then you go deeper, and you get into gluons and muons, and then string theory, and Newtonian dynamics breaks down. I mean, each of these models is equally as constructed in many ways as um, anything to do with the four elements. But what the four elements do that is useful is it's a really intuitive way of the mind seeing the world in terms of the solid piece of it, the earth, and in terms of the water, the blood, uh, the liquid element. So it's, it's a different model for a different purpose, but it works well. So what you do with this is um, really kind of you can, of the three, I find this is the most profound. Um, and it requires quite a lot of samadhi. Or it can happen, but it's hard to maintain because it's a vast reframing of all of your perceptions. And when people first experience this, it's pretty shaking. It's, um, often it doesn't happen when you're actually meditating, uh, but you have been meditating and then you relax into your daily life and suddenly it comes out of nowhere. So you'll wake up and you realize that the body that's lying on the bed 
isn't really different from the bed. You know, I mean, you take in this food and it replaces the cells in your body and then the food goes out. But where does the body begin and the world end? Where does the air you're inhaling begin and the air outside end? It's all kind of one and the same. And that moment when you realize uh, that continuity of earth, it's all earth, your earth. The blood is water, all things are water. It's a profound experience. And it can, um, shatter. It destroys the foundations upon which so much of our self-righteous self, our angry self, our greedy self is built upon. How can you get angry at sort of a conglomeration of earth? <laughs> You know, and when I've done it, um, the way I've approached the element contemplations is actually I will imagine the body decaying and the earth turning into earth and being overgrown by ferns and the water in my blood becoming the rain. And it issues into this profound sense of sweetness of giving back something you've borrowed. That's the secret is all of this stuff sounds awful dour and aversive, but all you're doing is loosening your grip just a little bit because you're going to have to let go eventually. So why don't you give it up a little bit before? And then when it's ripped out of your grip, you can pay attention to something else. You can look at the heart instead of just bemoaning the loss of what you thought was a refuge. I met a really famous uh, teacher named Lungpur C, who's acknowledged as, as, as a very special monk. And uh, all he would talk about was the four elements again and again. He said, this body is just earth, water, fire, air, that's it. And it's like Arahant's perception can turn on this perception. So it's worth cultivating. And uh, I think one disciple of Ajahn Lee, a famous teacher, uh, apparently some non-Buddhist friends came up to him and asked, you know, if we come and beat you up, what's the problem? It's the body's not self, right? What's the issue? And he said, look, I'm borrowing it. I have to take good care of it. <laughs> so, so it's how Ajahn Chah said it. It's like in this path, we do pick things up, but we pick them up lightly and then we can lay them down. And the body having some tools where you can learn to step back from it a little bit is useful. And it'll allow your samadhi to deepen. If you come to four days into a meditation retreat and you find you just can't pursue your meditation object anymore, think about some dead bodies. <laughs> See how it, or think about you know the bones, or think about your skin, think about your hair. And what you might find is it's exactly the medicine you need. Like your mind's really interested because it know it's, knows it's missing something. And it just will circle around this. And you find the mind becoming more and more luminous. And, um, and then it's like you've poured some of that full glass of samadhi into the place it's supposed to be. And then you can come back to your samatha object and it'll be even deeper. It's the problem with Western practice right now is because body contemplation is never taught, it's as if we're all hopping on one foot trying to get to the goal. You need the other foot. This is Vipassana, insight, in the most powerful sense. It's what was taught again and again by the senior teachers. And if you're an aversive type, you do want to be careful with it. Um, but it's, uh, it's a powerful practice and it's worth pursuing. So. Become calm, let the mind become bright, and if it begins to move of its own accord, then you can bring the body into awareness and see what interests you and follow that. And um, good luck, I hope none of you have been turned too off by body contemplation. <laughs> Thank you.
Sadhu, 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 Anumodami. So we have um, some time for Q&A now. If people would like anything people would like to talk about, just raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you and maybe say your name before you talk. Um, people in the live stream can chat, uh, type questions in the chat as well. And uh, if you feel shy about a question, still please consider bringing it up for the sake of everyone. Uh, odds are other people have the same question. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Kyle. Uh, you're on the f note of four elemental contemplation. Um, with regards to the whole in general, what other aspects would there be in reality that wouldn't be the four elements? That's a good question. <laughs> The Buddha uh, gave four elements much of the time. Sometimes he would list six, and he'd add on consciousness and space. And I think that's a really useful, it's a brilliant move. Um, because often in your meditation you have been with those elements and then you see that your whole awareness has expanded and become bright and wide much wider than the body. You know, like Long Force Sumedha says, we think of consciousness as in the body, but it's much more that the body is within consciousness. And um, you can really identify with space and, and consciousness itself, that broad thing. And, and the Buddhist, his adding that six is a way of saying, even those you, you shouldn't identify with. Um, and uh, it, it's also useful that in that breath contemplation largely, breath meditation largely deals with the breath, uh, the wind element, you know, it's sort of watching this movement of subtle energy through the body. And uh, there will come a point where the mind's calm and bright and it expands and rises. And if you have this residual perception of your mind is in this body, it feels constricting and suffocating. And that's when it's so useful to bring to mind space and consciousness. And that just lets that awareness grow and expand past the body. But as to what exists beyond the body and the material realm, for example, what would travel between life to life or carry kama, um, for those who are open to such things. Um, the Buddha didn't go into it because I don't think he saw it as useful. You know, um, the Buddha was a pragmatist. He taught us how to contemplate in order to let go. And what you're letting go into, um, that, he just said, it's called nirvana. It's the ending of greed, hatred, and delusion, and it's pretty great. You should go for it. Um, but it's beyond words, so why try to describe it in a way that'll make you attach? So the final element that he did talk about was the nirvana element, and that's the deathless, the transcendent. But he didn't speak about it much for fear that we would attach, I think. Does that answer slash not answer that? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> The Buddha was very precise in which questions he didn't answer for a very particular reason. And much of the last two millennia of Western philosophy has been a bunch of philosophers trying to answer the questions the Buddha said just weren't, weren't worth it. Like, learn to get calm with your breath for a while and then we'll, you know, sort of where he was at, I think, more. Gavin? Hi, my name's Gavin. I was wondering if you had any instruction for those who are adverse of types in order to approach certain kinds of body contemplation in a useful way. Thank you. That's a good question. Much of the path is um, letting go of the course while simultaneously reaching towards the more refined. 
you know, so body contemplation works because as we practice and as your heart rests in samadhi or, or gets calmer and brighter, it's like it has a new ground to stand on as it lets go of the body. And it will only be willing to let go of the body insofar as it intuits that brightness. Like, that's why bhavana mayapanya, wisdom from practice, happens dependent on the calm of the mind because if the mind really, only when the mind's internally happy in and of itself will it be willing to kind of see the fragility of what it has tied in itself progress. to. <laughs> so um, what that means is that for greed types, body contemplation is a way of letting go of the course. But for aversive types, I think it's more useful to reach Reporting towards the refined. stopped. To reach Sorry. towards the refined. So instead of focusing on letting go of the course, you focus on reaching towards the refined, which is why the development of metta is so useful for aversive types, even though it's harder for aversive types, it's more powerful and, and meaningful. And breath contemplation too, that's what the Buddha taught. There's a big event where a bunch of monks uh, committed suicide after body contemplation, and that's when the Buddha taught mindfulness of breathing as this powerful, bright object that would counterbalance. So for aversive types, I think focusing on brightening the mind, because um, you won't have as much a problem letting go of all the other stuff, like you kind of don't like it anyways <laughs> as an aversive type. So yeah, the Buddha, um, what did he say? Aversion is a great stain, but easily and quickly let go of. Greed is a light stain, but it takes a long time to let go of. We take the scenic route. Delusion is both a great stain and it takes a long time to get rid of. So, <laughs> The problem with people who are delusion types, which could be any of us, is none of us really know we're delusion types. So, and we all, we all. <laughs> it's a, uh, Paul Breider once asked Ajahn Chah, he said, I see greed and hatred, but I, I can't see delusion. And Ajahn Chah said, uh, you're riding on a horse and asking where the horse is. So, yeah, we're all a nice mix. Anyone on the chat or live stream, Grace, or has it been going in and out a bit? It went in and out a bit, but there is one question. Um, so we can keep going. Can you hear me okay with my two masks on? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Katie. And yeah, as you know, Tani Subo, we've been talking about this a lot recently. Uh, Subo is something that I've been starting to practice with over the last few weeks. And um, I guess I have kind of two questions. I'm just curious, like, personally, how often you practice it? And I'm trying to figure out, I know there's not, like, a cadence I can come up with, but I'm kind of struggling sometimes to determine if, like, negative mind states are coming up because of the asuba, or if sometimes there's something else, like, just emotionally charged going on in my life. Um, it's something I want to keep practicing, and as a as a person who's more of a greed type, it seems to really brighten my mind a lot. But I'm, yeah, I'm kind of struggling with like how frequently to do it and how to really discern when it's the asuba or, or when it's something else going on. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's such a powerful practice. Like it really strikes at kind of the heart of the defilements, um, such that its reverberations usually take a few days to feel. So drawing that through line between the negative states and the practices is harder with the suba because often like you'll find like two days later you'll be really grumpy and be like, wait, like is this the suba or something else? But there's also just the vicissitudes of practice where when you have a good meditation, like if you do find contemplating a soup is bringing up this brightness, then you can kind of expect the next day, like the defilements will fight back quite hard. Like whenever I have a really good meditation, I'm always like, oh no, tomorrow it's just going to be hard. <laughs> um, so that's part and parcel of it is it is a dynamic balance. Um, so the only way to parse that out is to kind of just track it over a bigger period of time. And I suggest keeping a journal because you can kind of forget about 
like really writing things out, like being like, I practiced a suba today, and then two days, you know, seeing what practice you did, and then writing down your general mind state, or if it really hits back hard. But often there's a particular feel to like defilement that's really fighting back, in that it'll like, often after practicing a suba, the next day I'll have a lot of lust come up. Um, over time, the lust wears away, but it does hit back quite distinctly. Uh, the day after often for me. So you just have to trace that pattern a bit in yourself, but be wary of it. You know, using it too much can be an issue. Um, and uh, I'd say that in terms of how much I practice it, um, there's been periods where my main meditation word has been bones. Um, I just find it like, bones are such a powerful object. I say the most, probably the most common uh, one that people are attracted to. Um, and often you don't even have to picture the bones. It's just you can say it and it'll reverberate and brighten samadhi for greed types. Um, but what I do more now is when my mind begins to go down a rabbit hole of lust, and there's no good ending for that. Like, it just gets hotter and hotter, you know, um, the more you feed into it. And I just cut it off now fast. Um, so often, like, the moment an image comes up with that, that like, gist to it, um, really just thinking about, um, you know, someone's, like, stomach. <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, what they look like underneath. And, you know, without the skin, people look same, male or female. It's all just a body. And once again, it sounds dour, but you just start to... It's such a gift to not get caught on the veil and you actually get to see people for who they are. Like we dismiss people so easily because of their age. You know, for example, like an older person sometimes, I don't think we even see it, but we've been really conditioned by our culture to like, you know, and, and it's such an act of violence towards those around us. And it's why people trust monastics at least a little bit more is because they know that we're not you know, in it for any sort of romantic relationship. Like, what a gift to be able to give people. So I really think reframing it as a gift is good. Um, but yeah, finding the right rhythm, that, that takes a bit of time. And just be wary of it, I'd say, a bit. That, yeah, that helps. And I'm, and I'm kind of on the flip side of that. Is it, you know, it's like exercising or meditating. That you need to do it a certain amount of time for it to have powerful effects. So I'm wondering that too, like... You know, I've probably been doing it every couple of weeks or something like that. But is is there kind of like, yeah, would there be a place where it's like, if you only do it a couple of times, that's not really going to have an effect? No, a soup is pretty powerful. It's a huge shift in perception. Um, but I'd say like, you know, making a space in your meditation for it once a week could hurt just to see if it's there's an opening. But really it comes down to if you can get to that calm, bright place where the mind begins to move of its own accord... Um, and it won't go to its samatha object, that's when you know it's time, often, often. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did we have a live stream question? Yeah. It's a question from the Zoom practicality question. For this Asuba practice, do you just cycle through contemplation of each element, nails, head hair, body hair, skin, in sequence around and around for the duration of the sit? And then there's a follow-up to that. And do you combine the elements, like water equals blood, etc., contemplation with that, or do that separately? So a good resource, um, there's a PDF called Bag of Bones on Access to Insight. If you type it in, it's like all these quotes of body contemplation compiled by a monk. Um, with the 32 parts, this question kind of balanced between the 32 parts and the elements. Um, with the 32 parts, run through them, you can find them online, or just go through the ones you I, I listed, like the external things plus the bones plus maybe the blood. That's usually enough. And just find which one kind of interests you, and you don't keep cycling. You, you find one that really grabs your attention, where the mind kind of sees something. Um, 
And then you just pick that up and raise it up and contemplate breaking the thing down, looking at it close up, um, you know, comparing it to external objects, like the fact that the bones really are just stone. What's the difference? Bone, stone, bone, stone. And if you just say these things in your head in a calm place, the mind will begin, it's like you're teaching the mind in this really malleable place where it's, it's, it's seeing something. And over time of doing this, you'll develop some certain like almost reels of footage that you're ready to play, like where you've, you have a certain way of, you know, dismantling a bone and watching it fade into the earth and be overgrown by ferns that will just bring this sense of coolness and release. And you can just run through that again and again and again. Or if you're even calmer, you can just have one word like bones, stone, this is not you. Um, the elements, often it's a similar thing where, you're, where, where you'll find one that uh, interests you the most. Usually it'll be earth and water. Um, and yes, you, you look at those elements within yourself. So the earthiness of the body compa uh, compared to the earthiness of earth and how are those really different? Or the water of the body, the blood compared to the water of earth. Um, and the easiest way to do this often is watching the body decay into the earth and the blood become the rain, etc. And just seeing how it's one and the same. Once again, I find approaching it through the 32 parts is more accessible. Um, elemental contemplation requires a lot of samadhi. It's, it's worth trying when you can, but I think it's less accessible in general. Um, it's just such a shift in perception. It's really, it's, it's I think there's a reason why uh, it's spoken of in that way. So, yeah, usually find one. One is plenty and focus in it and play around with the object and see if you can see truth about it. I think that might be the time we have. Okay. Sorry, newcomers, for hitting you with that one right off the bat. <laughs> We're not always so dour, but uh, anyways. So um, we have a, let's do the blessing braid first. Um, can someone pull that up on their phone, uh, the PDF from our website, perchance? Anyone, Kyle, do you, are you pulling it up? Okay. If someone could go on to clearmountainmonastery.org, go to the blessing braid and pull up the Excel sheet, the Google sheet. Uh, and while they're doing that, John, you got it? Okay, so while someone's bringing over a mic to John, um, if others want to just say the names of someone they'd like to bring to mind now to hold in their hearts and to practice to, it can be someone who's passed recently or who's having a hard time that you just like to dedicate merit to, dedicate goodness. Mintu. Mintu. Bob, who had a traumatic brain injury. Jane, who died in July. They have COVID. And Betty. John, do we have the blessing braid? Yeah, for Billy, undergoing chemotherapy, spread loving kindness. For Sogol, back injury. For Charles, going in for surgery Monday, spread metta. For Mary, past, please spread merit and metta for a safe journey. For Elizabeth, suffering from an old and sick body, please spread metta. For Bill, fighting for, fighting for life after a car accident, Spread meta. For Sherry, passed away years ago this week. Loving mother of four. Please spread loving kindness. This is the way we hold people in our hearts and remember that this practice is, is a gift, not just for us. If people want to turn to uh, page 30. 
And I mean 31, as usual. It's a fusion with the divine abidings. And if you're on the live stream, you can find the link in the details of the video. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with compassion, Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with gladness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with equanimity, Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a heart imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will.